Let us go to the word, Isaiah 43, 25. I, even I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. Amen. Let's also go to Matthew 18, 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold and repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees and before him, be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him cancel the debt and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His servant, fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what he had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I cancel all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned to him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Amen. God is righteous and merciful. 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 Psalm 116 verse 5 says those two seemingly opposing or contradictory attributes together. God is righteous and merciful. Why am I saying they're seemingly opposing or contradictory? Well, first, because he's righteous, he judges. So righteousness means the law and what is right. So he does according to what is right. He is righteous, so he judges and punishes sin. As Psalm 7, 11 says, God is a righteous judge, a God who displays his wrath every day. But because he is also merciful, he forgives the sin of those who turn back. So Micah, the, the prophetic book in the Old Testament 7, 18 to 19 says, Who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of of the sea. Isn't that wonderful? That he will not hold, a, hold against us, but he will pardon sin. Also in Isaiah 44, 22, I have swept away your offenses like a cloud, your sins like the morning mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Have you returned to him? How many of you returned to him and have received his forgiveness? That's what the Christian faith is. That's where our Christian faith begins. Hearing the good news, which is the gospel of his forgiveness, receiving that is what makes us Christian. This is where we begin, not end, but begin. So Christian faith is receiving God's forgiveness and we don't end there as in until we lose our breath, until we leave this universe and as we long to escape the burning universe, this finite space, although it is immense, this is a space that's reserved for the fire, the fire of hell, where sin will be punished forever. We want to escape this burning universe which is what we've been hearing all year, the salvation of my soul and enter eternal life to the Father's house we want to go. How many of you want to do that? Then we have homework. We have tasks at hand each and every day that we're given. We are to live according to this faith, which is about his forgiveness. That is, as we just read in Matthew 18, as well as Matthew 6 talks about that, forgiving those who sin against me, forgiving those who owe me, uh, as I will define the word. So uh, sin and debt are treated the same in, in the biblical context. So forgiving those who sin against me and proclaiming this good news of forgiveness, as John 20, 23 says. As the Lord's Prayer teaches us, and we certainly hear in EM in uh, 2023 and 2024, 
uh, we went to the summer retreat and we did half of the Lord's Prayer and we finished it this year and we spent great time uh, hearing about forgiveness. But I think it's still important in the context of salvation. Forgiveness and salvation is so, so important. So I want you to listen very carefully. This is so important because sin is still what we, so current to us and therefore forgiveness is extremely important in every one of us, each of us, our lives. Is that true? Yes, because again, unless I'm forgiven, I'm not saved, right? So we start with forgiveness, receiving God's forgiveness, but I need to continue on sustaining that state, which is then carrying out into action, forgiving others who sin against me and doing the work of proclaiming God's forgiveness until leaving this place and being saved, having my salvation completed in the Father's house. Amen? The Lord's Prayer says, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Once again, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Debtors. So that is talking about sin. Um, so the Greek word uh, is aphiomi, um, and it's a compound word from and to send off or to let go, and the corresponding Hebrew word has same uh, meaning, or uh, these words have the same meaning, to lift burden um, or to carry or take away, um, which in one word, pardon, you know, it, it expresses. So in the Greek or Roman, uh, Greek or Roman world, this concept of forgiveness was often used in legal and financial transactions. So and if you are in banking, you might know this, or if you have student loans or mortgage, you, you understand about that, right? So debt and forgiveness, right? So being, I mean, that's just almost, it's a, almost, it'll be a dream, dream, like who gets their debt uh, forgiven, right? So unless something really happens, most, most people will owe and then have to pay back gradually, right? Um, but it's that word. So in uh, the Greek word, aphiomi, which is a very versatile um, uh, term to convey the act of sending away or letting go, um, and it translates as forgive in the biblical context. So it means to release someone from a debt. Someone owes a lot, so just like the passage we read in Matthew 18, someone owes money and is thrown into prison, uh, but the moment the master lets him go, it's releasing him of his debt. So he's no longer obligated for that debt that he had to pay back. So it's a conscious decision, decision from the person who has the authority to, in the place, uh, is in the place of, or has the authority to, uh, to forgive, to release that person from the burden of guilt uh, or obligation. So that's the definition of forgiveness. Right? So it, it's, you know, maybe some of you thinking like, oh, I forgive you or like, forgive me, um, which is very important but it has that connection. So if you think about in monetary or financial terms or even legal terms that you can understand, people who are desperate for forgiveness are not just who uh, is owed an apology from their friends, um, but you can also think about people who are on trial, who have charges against them, who are um, the defendant or of, of you know, some case, or maybe have already been convicted and now sentenced a, a lifetime um, serving in prison or even on death row. Uh, these are people who are truly desperate to be uh, forgiven. So when, uh, as again, Pastor Kang spoke about authority last week and we reviewed it on Friday, um, the authority of a king or even the president of the United States, uh, just like many countries around the world, um, that executive um, office has the authority to pardon people. So it is political. Um, it is depending on, you know, the other people can be like, what, how could you let? But that's the power of the president. I mean, it's not a king's, but it almost seems like a king's, right? So it's a great power uh, to release these people under their authority. Uh, but even if you're not in that, on that scale of needing forgiveness and forgiving, having great, uh, such great power, but in everyday setting, uh, people struggle uh, uh, from the sufferings they have uh, incurred or been caused in their life by financial harm by people, physical harms, and a lot for most of people, emotional harms. So uh, when people have this memory of being harmed, um, they resent. 
So resentment comes, uh, and the sense of um, betrayal they get. So when the emotional uh, harm comes as a result of some boyfriend, girlfriend, some lover or spousal relationship going bad, and they have that sense of betrayal or even friendship. Um, so you have damage to... Uh, again, damages financial, physical, emotional, um, but also damage to reputation, right? So someone owed you money and maybe in your name opened up an account, bank account, or took out loans and you co-signed, you didn't realize what you were signing for, but it's like, sure, I'll do it. And then they run the other way and you have to pay uh, for their debt, then your credit score gets damaged. So the credit score is like such a, you know, value for uh, civil society like, like ours here, or advanced societies like ours. So um, it is a very sensitive thing. So you have that kind of damage um, caused by these poor choices and actions, but more trivial stuff, trivial every day, and you could even call these petty stuff, like people being rude to you, people saying rude things about you, um, or people being in, uh, inconsiderate uh, and doing uh, things that are um, what you would call indiscretion, uh, and then people hold grudges. So these are examples of how in everyday life we have the reasons to become hardened in our hearts and not be able to forgive. So um, again, because they have this memory of what they had done in the past uh, and that memory is so powerful that even though they say with their lips, I forgive them, but every time they see them, it's like my dog looking at the post office. There's like rumbling. I'm like, what's going on? Is there an earthquake in the house? <laughs> it's like, sees the postman, uh, the mailman trucking the, down the road. It's like, and it's like that. Humans have that kind of re reaction. Like you have uh, some past uh, incident, and then you see the person. You might not growl like the dog, but it's like, yeah. So that's called grudge. And uh, really, what grudge is this ill feeling um, that comes as a result of past injury, past harm. So it's a lot to do with the past. Um, so that is sort of accruing and therefore um, humans have struggled uh, forgiving their own parents uh, and their children. But a lot of times it's not really parents not being able to forgive children. Most of the time it's the other way, if you think about that. Children hold this sort of resentment towards their parents, while parents overlook that. Again, there are some exceptions, but for the most part, this is how it happens. But we could still think about, again, our partners, uh, spouses, friends, co-workers, um, boss, um, to society in general. Um, people have this, humans have, that animals do not have, this disease. It really is an incurable disease, in fact, of not being able to forgive. And that, that, that um, the lacking of the ability or the, the power to forgive is what ruins the person's life, really. And even in the world, people go through therapies and they find ways to deal with that. Um, but how much more in, in, in the spiritual life and faith life in the biblical context? What the Bible shows us is that forgiveness is freedom. What is it? Forgiveness is freedom. Because what it shows us is that those who are forgiven are set free from sin, from the price of sin, that is, from the power of death. How many of you know that? That freedom. You've been set free by his amazing grace. Amen? Yeah. Not only that, those who forgive are able to forgive are also set free from their past damage, hurts, and loss. So being forgiven is freedom, and forgiving is also freedom. Heaven is a place where there is no time, right? So heaven has no time um, because it's eternity. And that means there's no past in heaven. So you may ask the question, like, are we going to recognize each other in heaven? Like, am I going to see my mommy when I go to heaven? That's what I asked. But no, no. You won't see your mommy. You won't know who's your mommy. You won't know who's your daddy. You won't know who your child is and who your husband and wife. They may be there, but you won't know. Oh my God, so that's so sad. No, not really at all. You're still going to be happy. Even if you don't have that past relationship, you will still be happy. We will still be happy being in the presence of God. 
That's what heaven is. So heaven has no past, so you can kind of throw in what comes with past, not just good feels, but a lot of resentment. The history of damage and hurts and loss, so resentment, anger, grudge, hatred, heaven has none of that. Do you want to go to heaven? Uh-oh, only, only 40% of the room wants to go to heaven. You want to go to heaven? Yes. Then, without forgiving, you cannot enter. Without forgiving, you cannot enter. We read about that in Matthew 18 there. Also, Matthew 5, 26, Jesus said, uh, Jesus gave um, also another uh, parables about forgiveness. And he said, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. You will not get out, as in you're thrown into prison, locked up, and you will not get out unless, until you pay back until the last penny. So until you make your payment full to the full and completely pay off, you cannot get out. So this imagery of being locked up somewhere and you can't get out unless you pay off is not heaven at all. It's definitely not the Father's house, which is the holy city, and which is actually bound, as in this is the place where it's filled with light, with his glory. Those without light, without glory, without life, cannot enter. Those who are not set free cannot enter there. So they may not go to hell, although I'm going to talk about it. Some other parts, what Jesus describes sounds like hell. If you're locked up, that sounds worse than the dark place outside the holy city. So we've been talking about the holy city, the Father's house in heaven, and outside of it is this dark space, darkness outside, where those who have not done his will, according to his will, are thrown out. Those who have not paid will be thrown out, where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. So again, why is forgiveness so important? Because of sin. The Bible talks about three types of sin. Let's go to Genesis 2-7. The Lord God... Formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. So God created a human, first human day six of his six-day creation, which we were about in Genesis 1. By his word, he created all things. And he blessed the first humans, male and female, to procreate, to multiply, fill the earth. Later on, we see in Genesis 2 here, he chose one man, human, and breathe into him the breath of life, making him, him a living being. So living being means spirit, through the spirit of, um, the spirit breath of God coming from spirit God, man became a living being, a spiritual being. And his name is Adam. He's the ancestor of all mankind. So from him came all of us. So he passed down not only the flesh body, but also spirit inside the flesh body. So we are spirit and flesh together. Believe it or not, that's what the Bible says at the get-go. So I'm a living being. Say it with me. I'm a spiritual being. Right now, I don't feel the spirit, but the flesh, I feel. But this is the container, if you will, or the bag, the body that holds the spirit. And in verse 17, it, uh, we see our ancestor Adam living in the garden. God gives him to live, uh, the word to live by. You must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. So that was the word that the spirit man had to live by. But we know in next chapter, a serpent came and deceived um, Adam through Eve to take the fruit and saying, you will not die. You will not surely die. God was just bluffing. You will eat the fruit. You can eat the fruit and you will not die. Instead, you will be like God. You will open your eyes and be the judge, the boss himself. And those words were sweet to his ears, and Adam ate the fruit. That moment, physically, he didn't die right away. He actually lived hundreds of years, kicked out of the garden uh, a bit, but still uh, physically continued on. The spirit had died. Romans 5.12 says, sin had entered the spirit at that moment. And that sin is called the original sin. What kind of sin? Original sin. And David talks about in Psalm 51.5 that I was sinful at birth. I was conceived in my mother's womb in sin. So we were born in sin, dead in sin, because the price of sin is death. Again, not like physical death, you stop breathing and die and perish. But spirit, uh, when it dies, it means it's cut off from God to be thrown away, f as far as possible away from God, as in the place of eternal death, that is hell. That's the price of sin, and that's the price of the original sin. So the, out of the three types of sin, we have the original sin that all men have inherited along with the spirit of Adam. 
Secondly, um, because men don't know that they um, have the original sin or the fact that they even have spirit, eventually God called on the people of Israel uh, in the Old Testament and gave them the commandments that said, do this, don't do this. If you do what I tell you to, if you do what I tell you to not to do, that's sin. If you don't do what I tell you to do, that's sin. Right? So breaking the commandment was sin, uh, and that is called the self-committed sins. So self-committed sins are the sins that we commit with our own bodies to know that, wait, the law says I'm guilty. Therefore, understanding, in fact, I have inherited sin and I have death in my spirit as a result. How many times did we cover so far? Two. What are they? The original sin and the self-committed sins. And what's the third type, Logos students? The sins of desire that we read about in Cain's story. Adam's son, or had two sons initially, Cain and Abel. Cain kills Abel out of envy, out of jealousy, because Abel's sacrifice was received by God while Cain's was not. So he was actually angry in his heart uh, and wanted to kill his brother. So Genesis 4, 6, God said to him, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do, if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you. But you must master it. You must rule over it. You must crush it. So we all have this sort of desires in the heart brewing. And we talked about thoughts and hearts in last week about deceiving spirits, temptations. All these things are the sins of desire in our hearts that carry out into action. So we see the tendency of the original sin, Adam, right after he sinned, he uh, blames his wife. When God said, did you eat the fruit I told you not to eat? And he said, well, the woman you put here with me, gave it to me, and I ate. I ate, but it was her who made me eat it. And she, where did she come from? From you. But remember what he said of her. This is the bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. Dun, 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 dun. When you get married, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. And next day, why did I get married? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I know all the guys are laughing really loudly. Um, so <laughs> it's reality, it's life, yes. Um, so the tendency of the original sin is resenting others and blaming others. And the tendency of sins of desire is really being angry, seeing others' success, others' prosperity. It's like brewing in, in, in anger. So the law given to Israel in the Old Testament can be broken into two parts. The commandments uh, regarding God, uh, speaking of the Ten Commandments, the first one, two, three, four commandments were about sin against God. It's warning against sin against God. And then number five to ten are about iniquities, that is sin against men. So that is what defines sin in the time of the Old Testament, the time of the law. But because, and, and because God is righteous, the commandment said, as God says, I do not forgive sin, I judge and punish sin. So you too must not tolerate sin, not forgive sin, but instead when two or th there are two or three witnesses, stone them right away. You do it. That's what the law commanded, commanded. So God does not forgive, also you must not forgive. Wow, that is very serious and very scary. That's the righteousness, righteous part of God. But when we started 15 minutes ago, who is God? God is righteous and God is merciful. So these two seemingly opposing attributes of God are together. So on the one hand, he's righteous, and through the law, Israel knew that. They had to punish sin. But because he's merciful, there was the sanctuary, or the tabernacle initially, and then the temple of Jerusalem, where they were commanded to bring sacrifice. Sacrifice for for the atonement of their sins. So in Leviticus 4, it talks about sin offering, and Leviticus 16 talks about atoning sacrifice. Let's actually look at that together. Leviticus 16, chapter 16, verses 8 to 10. Leviticus. Okay. He is to cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord, and the other for the scapegoat. Aaron shall bring the goat, whose lot falls to the Lord, and sacrifice it for a sin offering. But the goat chosen by Lot as the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement by sending it to the wilderness as a scapegoat. So right now we have two goats, two live goats that are brought to the, um, the, the tabernacle. Um, and then one, they draw a lot. 
uh, and then the one who gets picked as the sacrifice for the Lord gets sacrificed, killed. But the other one, by default, becomes a scapegoat, is kept alive for a different reason. As it says, it will be sent off into the wilderness as scapegoat. Remember sending off, released, paying off, right? Go to verse 21. He is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins, and put them on the goat's head. He shall send the goat away into the wilderness in the care of someone who appointed the task. The goat will carry on itself all their sins to a remote place, and the man shall release it in the wilderness. So the two live goats, one is sacrificed and his blood drained, the fat, all that separated and given to the Lord in the uh, sanctuary. But the other one is kept alive. So the way these goats carry and atone, meaning um, redeem or pay the price of sin and eventually forgive the sins of Israel was that the priest will have that confession of the sins of Israel over the goat. First, the, uh, the sacrificed goat. Goat doesn't know anything, but the goat is symbolically now receiving the sin of Israel and is killed off so that the goat is given to God to satisfy, to appease God so that he's no longer angry at Israel for their sin. Meanwhile, the scapegoat is waiting outside. Again, he doesn't know what's going on. The priest comes back out from the most holy place. The same sins are confessed over the live goat. This time, this goat is called scapegoat because he's not going to get killed by the priest. But instead, he will be Release. The goat will be released into the wilderness. And their um, folktale had said there was a monster called Azazel living in the forest. So they will send off the goat to be eaten by this monster. So what does that mean? All the rebellion and wickedness that the first goat had died for, the second goat is alive. All that memory, the guilt, is sent off. So that, do you think the goat will ever come back? If it were a cat, it comes back. Cats always come back. Even dogs sometimes, but cats always come back. Pretty scary. But goats never come back. They never come back. In fact, some wild animal is going to eat it. So what that means is that sin will never return. And that goes with what we read in Isaiah 43, 25. The Lord saying, I, even I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. And I, for my own sake, and remembers your sins no more. So what it's saying is that he for himself, because God cannot stand remembering sin. He does not want to remember sin. But when you give the sacrifice to the Lord and you do it as he commands, for himself or his own sake, he chooses to remember sins no more. He chooses forgiveness and freedom. And we say, hallelujah. So that is how the people of Israel, on the one hand, fear the condemnation by the law, but held on to this practice of sacrifice because that was the only way that they can live another year through this day of atonement called Yom Kippur. And then in times of other um, uh, you know, mistakes they make committing sin, they will give guilt offering or sin offering that continued in the sanctuary later in the temple of Jerusalem. So that was the mechanism of God's mercy and grace for the people. So when one man coming according to prophecy, standing before the temple said, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Who, what was his name? Yeshua. What's the, what, what does the name mean? That's right. Matthew 121 says, he who saves his people from their sin. And it is, his, it is the father's name, John 5, 43. Father means not his biological father, but the heavenly father who sent him. That is God, the righteous and the merciful one. So standing before the temple, that meant the grace of God and hope for the people of Israel. He said, destroy it. But he didn't stop there. He said, I will raise it again in three days. At the time, nobody understood what he meant, but after his death and the resurrection three days after, the disciples remember what he said and said, that's what he was talking about. The temple represents the place where the name of God was. In the Old Testament, it was the name of Jehovah. But now he is saying, I have come as a new temple. Because remember, this temple, the temple of Jerusalem for the people of Israel, the Jews, has the name of Jehovah delivered by, delivered by angels. And it has the stone tablets to command you. And if you break, when you break, you will be judged and punished instantly. But if you want to sustain your breath, bring a sacrifice but it is just for another year. 
Actually, it's not just in a year. John, uh, Hebrews 10, 2 to 4, it actually says, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So even though they did it year after year and time by occasion, whenever they commit a sin, they kill countless animals, but it was actually a reminder of the sin because it is impossible for blood of animals, physical things to take away the sin of the spirit. So what Yeshua was saying was, as he was saying, destroy it and raise it again. He is saying now the son of God himself has come. And in the father's name of Yeshua, which name? Yeshua. Now he himself will become atoning sacrifice, a ransom. By giving his life for many, he will forgive, he will give life. And that he will perf perfect the righteousness and the mercy of God the Father. Amen? Of course, at the time, nobody understood that. But this is what Yeshua was referring to as we understand in the context of the will of God, his schedule that was fulfilled through the Son, who came in the name of Yeshua, which is the Father's name. What do we say in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father in heaven. Our Father in heaven. So Father, Father's name, Yeshua. We call his name Yeshua. But because it is a Father's name, it is the same as calling Father. When I'm saying Yeshua, I'm calling Father. And as I said earlier on, Many, many children can hold grudges and resentment, anger, even hatred towards their parents for what they had done for them or to them or not for them. But to a father who's a good father, by nature, father, a mother, a parent, there is no sin that a parent cannot forgive their, of, from their children, of their children. So the fact that he would complete this in the Father's name, we see the grace of God, the mercy of God. Amen? Hebrews 9, 12 says, He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves. Again, it is impossible to take away sin with blood of, go bl bl blood of goats and calves. But he entered mo the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. He will do it by his own blood, with his own blood, and that will be because his blood itself is eternal and the redemption that he makes with his blood is eternal. What does that mean? John 1.1. 1, 1. Go to John 1.1 1, 1, and then 1.29. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So who is God again? He is two things today. Righteous and merciful. So this is the righteous and merciful God in the beginning. That's his essence, his nature. Philippians 2, 6 is the very nature of God. This is in eternity before anyone, anything was created. Any, before any sin occurred, this is God who is righteous and merciful. On the one end, he will judge, but he will provide a way to show mercy by forgiving. All of that was decided in eternity and the way that was going to be accomplished, revealed and accomplished would be through the word. Did you understand that? That's the self-manifestation of God. God will be revealed as the word. And the word is not sound, but word is the person who is with God, the one God now differentiated, separated to come out and be revealed in history, visibly to be seen, to be heard of, to be known. And that's why in verse 14 it says what? The word became flesh and has made dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Because he came from the Father, he called himself the Son. But seeing him, verse 29, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said what? Look. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You understand? Here we're talking about John, not the, uh, the disciple who wrote the book of John, but John the Baptist, the prophet, who inspired by the Holy Spirit recognized who Yeshua is. And he baptized him, in fact, in, in the Jordan. So he recognized Yeshua as the Lamb of God. And when he says that, he's not thinking about lamb chop. He's not talking about lamb wool sweater. He's thinking about lamb as an atoning sacrifice. 
So again, it was goat, bull, or, or lamb that uh, they were given as sacrifice um, for, to atone sin for men in the Old Testament. These are clean animals according to law. So when John saw him, he's saying, this is the lamb of God. And Yeshua himself referring, he said, referring to himself, Matthew 20, 28, the son of man. What did he call himself? The son of man. So can we say together, the word in the beginning, the lamb of God, the son of man. Once again, the word in the beginning, the lamb of God, the son of man. So all that is to highlight the word in the beginning, we're going to add on the word in the beginning, who became flesh. So the word became flesh, the word became blood. The spirit became flesh, the spirit became blood. So his flesh, 100% flesh, but 100% spirit in its nature. So it has a function to feel the pains and the senses of whatever the environment. But he who knows no sin, for him to die on the cross according to the Father's will, had to have that flesh. So that's why the word became flesh. He came as the son of man, referring to himself all the time. The son of man, son of man, though he is the son of God, meaning the nature of God. That's his body. That's who he is. But he came as man to highlight the fact that like man, he lives, that like man, he will die. And he will die like the lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. But it will be according to the Father's will as he prophesied there in Matthew 20, 28. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Again, ransom is another word to highlight redemption, redeeming or atoning that is to pay the price of sin that is to pay the price on behalf of someone else to substitute another so that's why when men betrayed him and and uh, and nailed him to the cross he did not defend himself he did not perform any signs to release himself instead he went like a lamb a silent lamb he went to his death but it was according to the command that he received from the Father. John 10, 17 and 18. This is the authority. The command the Father gave him. And it was the authority to lay down his life willingly to take it up again. So in that moment of his painful death. And not only painful. But shameful. Because he was treated as a guilty one. He was nailed to the cross as a sinner. Treated like a sinner. Like an animal even. But as he died, in his last breath, he said, it is finished. Because that was when he accomplished the will that the Father sent him to do. What is that? It is to glorify the Father who is alone righteous and merciful. Because his righteous, his word is righteous. He judges righteously for he is the righteousness. And the word that he sent the son to fulfill, obey, is for him to lay down his life. So the son, understanding the father is righteous, what he commanded is righteous. And for that righteousness, I am laying down my life boldly, willingly, not like a coward, not like a loser. But he did it with all authority to lay down his life, trusting that the father will then show him mercy and save him from Hades, from Sheol, and he will resurrect. Hallelujah. So for him to die then, he had to be made sin. That's why 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, he, God made him who knows no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Psalm um, 7, 11, 13 says, God is a righteous judge, a God who displays his wrath every day. If he does not relent, he will sharpen his sword. He will bend and string his bow. He has prepared his deadly weapons. He makes ready his flaming arrows. He's breathing fire. No one can mess with him because he's righteous. He's the righteous judge and he does not tolerate any unrighteousness. The one that he had made to be the target of his righteousness and righteous judgment. And pull that arrow and shot that bullseye was the flesh of his very own son, Yeshua. And that was the moment he said, it is finished. And saying, Father, you alone are righteous to the point of making your son to be the recipient, the target of your wrath and your judgment. You want to be proven as the righteous God. Hallelujah. What does that mean? Mercy to us. 
Because when Yeshua died on the cross, he was made sin on our behalf. Who, who committed sin? It was us. Remember the three types of sin. We have plenty of sins to be guilty of. All of that, we did it to put on his body, basically. That's what we did. Although we weren't born then, we're talking about all mankind in the first Adam. It's 1 Corinthians 15, 45. All men are the first Adam. And he came as the last Adam, the life-giving spirit, to give life to the living spirit, living being. Through his torn flesh, he will shed his blood, which is life. That is redeeming blood, that cleanses, that washes, redeems, and forgives, and gives new life. So that those who receive his blood, who drink his blood, will be made alive. Hallelujah! That is the mercy of God that he showed none of to the enemy, the devil, who is the origin of sin. The sin that he committed in heaven and becoming rebellious angel who wanted to be like God. God waited for this moment of judgment. And this was a moment that God was avenging. He was repaying, repaying the enemy for the sin that he committed. Through the death of Yeshua, judgment was made. This is righteous. And all else is unrighteous. But by his mercy, by shedding his blood, whosoever receives the blood, the blood of the redeeming God, the redeemer, our redeemer, Yeshua, the lamb of God, that we are forgiven of our sins. He made the way. Hallelujah. So as he died, even though the men at the time hurled insults at him, spat at him and mocked him, even one of the thieves next to him and said, you call yourself a savior? Why don't you release yourself and release us? He did not avenge. Instead, he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Luke 23, 34, these were his last words, saying it is finished. And he's saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. This is something that a mother or father would say. A little child who may be kicking and screaming, maybe hits daddy or mommy by accident. Mother doesn't go, it's a little baby. Baby does not know anything. Kicking. Forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And some children do beat up their parents, but if the parents are mature, even so, they forgive their children. That's the heart of the father who forgives, and with that heart, Yeshua is saying, I hold nothing against them, even if they spat on me, even if they flogged me, even if they nail me. They're the ones who put the spear through my side and made me bleed to death, and I became sin even for them. Forgive them, Father. That's what Yeshua did. So that the word, as Hebrews 10, 17, 18 recounts, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more would be fulfilled. Hallelujah. He died. But just as he said in three days after his death, he resurrected. He resurrected and he appeared in his resurrected body to the disciples in John 20. We see him coming and other places, other books as well, coming through the locked doors and the walls that they were, where they were hiding. He came. He breathed on them in John 20, 22 and said, receive the Holy Spirit. He breathed on them. Receive the Holy Spirit. Why? What does that mean? He had said in John 14, 15, 16 ahead that he was going to go to the Father and send the Holy Spirit, the advocate, the counselor, he will, the helper. He will come. And what is he going to do is what he said after that. Breathing and saying, receive the Holy Spirit. And he said, if you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So he connected that to the coming of the Holy Spirit, receiving the Holy Spirit. And that is not to be misinterpreted and say, oh, so I become like the Pope? I forgive you. God forgives you. God does not forgive you. I'm not the Pope. This is not some popish statement. Absolutely not. Instead, what it means is empowered by the Holy Spirit, believers will now declare the message, share the good news of the forgiveness of sin done by Yeshua's work, his redemption. Hallelujah. So after having that work done, he ascended to heaven. He is the lamb upon the throne, lamb on the throne, who still holds scars forever and ever, the scars that testify, I have redeemed. I have paid the price of sin for all mankind, whoever you are, how many sins, how many ever sins you have committed. You can't even count with your, all your toes and your fingers. 
all your, and that's just last few hours. Whoever you are, how many ever sins you have committed, I have redeemed all your sins for all mankind. The sins that you have committed before and sins that you will commit after, I have redeemed them all. What do you say? Hallelujah. To make this be known, the Holy Spirit was sent to the world in the name of the Redeemer, Yeshua. And he comes not to unbelieving world, but only the believers who believe in the redemption of Jesus Christ, the Son, and receive the redeeming blood. Say amen. If you have welcomed the blood of Yeshua. And that is to say, I believe in the name, the name of Yeshua to be the name of my Savior. I open my heart and I receive welcome, therefore the blood. So the blood comes like, like the content of a little pouch, like a little bag that is called the name of Yeshua. When I call on the name and make that name to be the name of my Savior, my Lord, I am receiving his blood. In John 1, 12, whoever believes and receives will re receive the, uh, whoever receives and believes in the name will receive the right to become children of God. How many of you have received the blood of God? Do you call him Abba Father, our Father in heaven? Amen. I'm a child of God because I believe in the redemption of Yeshua. So did Yeshua forgive our sins through his death? What he did on the cross was that forgiveness. What is it? Redemption, right? So we want to now tease out, but although it's not completely wrong because sometimes that is described as forgiveness. But what Yeshua did is what his work, what we believe in is his redemption. When we believe, the moment we believe that he paid the price of sin in my place, that I have to go. I have to go to hell because of my sin. So number one, you have to confess that you're a sinner. You have to. And in order for you to know that you're a sinner, you need to know about the law. That's why we spend a great deal of time in the Old Testament, what the Word says, and how it convicts us, condemns us as guilty. So when, that you, when you confess that you're a sinner, then you can open your heart and be desperate for the Redeemer, Yeshua, to know Yeshua as the Redeemer who did the work of paying the price of my sin in my place because he died and his death is not like our physical death because his body is spirit, his death was spiritual death. Do you understand? We, on the other hand, lose the flesh. The spirit gets resurrected to be thrown into the fire of hell. That's spiritual death forever. That's the result of sin. Because, he, because God is righteous, who judges and punishes sin. But Yeshua did it. With, unbeknownst to me, I was not around. That happened 2,000 years ago. But somebody from Cape Town came up to me and said, Hello? Are you a Christian? No. Do you know anything about Jesus? You want to come to Bible study? That's what the Bible says. Oh, wow, 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 wow. Okay, amen, amen. And you're welcome in tears. I welcome Yeshua. I want to be forgiven. Hallelujah. That is the moment you receive the redemption and you know that you are, you are redeemed, that you have been redeemed. Have you had that experience? I have been redeemed. How? When? When Yeshua died on the cross and when I received when i believe in the works then the redemption takes effect in me and that is when the father forgives sin because as we read in the lord's prayer as we know our father in heaven so we are speaking to the father and says give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors so it's the father who does the work of forgiving, the son redeems. So two things, the son redeems, the father forgives. Let's say it together. Tell your neighbor, one person says the father, the other son. Go ahead. Switch now. Once again, what is it? The son redeems, the father forgives. The son did it all. Because if you say he forgave from the... Yes, he said, Father, forgive them. That's what he said. Father, forgive them. Father, you're the one who's going to forgive them. Yes? If we say Jesus is the one who forgave from the cross, then nobody will go to hell. Right? The redemption has been done for all. So that work is all done. Now I need to bring my faith into that. Faith into redemption. Redemption plus faith. 
is when I'm forgiven. Do you understand? So who, who forgives? The Father. So that's why in benediction, by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God or the love of the Father, which uh, 2 Corinthians 13, 14, we talked about last night, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, it says the three persons in that order, it's because you need to receive the blood, the grace of the Son first in order for you to be forgiven by the Father, know his love, therefore, and then have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. So the question is, have you been forgiven then? How many of you know that you have been forgiven? When you believe in his redemption, then you are forgiven by the Father. Amen. So as the word said, those who return to him. So returning is repentance. I'm crying out, Father, forgive me. So I am returning to him. He promises, I will blot out their sins. I will remember their sins no more. And you say, thank you, Father. Hallelujah. The blood has the power to forgive and forget. To what? To forgive and forget. Is that easy to do? Forgive is not easy. But what's even more difficult or impossible is forgetting. Remember. Yeah, that. I want you to remember that. Anything, anytime something pops up, remember your pastor going. Yeah. Humans have no ability to completely forget what they need to. I mean, again, it's like we, we don't want to forget Logos test information. But we remember every little thing somebody did wrong. It's a selective memory, really. All right, stuff that I want to remember, I keep on forgetting. But stuff that I want to forget, when I see someone doing something, it's like, oh, yeah, I remember them doing that, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I remember them saying something to me. I remember 15 years ago, in five months and three days. I remember what kind of clothes they were wearing. Yep. I know. Wow, it's true. Isn't that so sad? How sad is that they remember that? But when God says, I will remember their sin no more, he means it because he alone is perfect. He can do that. And we believe it. Amen. So why is this a problem? If I am forgiven, say amen. If you believe that you have been forgiven, all your many, many sins have been forgiven. Amen. Then do I still need to be forgiven today? Of course you, we do. So this is where, like, the theology divides. People will say, I, once I've been saved, then I, I'm saved forever. Really? So then we don't have the half of the, more than half of the New Testament. You end it with the four gospel books, maybe book of Acts, and that's it. The rest of the New Testament is all speaking to churches and Christians to, to struggle against sin and do not sin and fear the judgment that is coming. So if you really pay attention to what you're reading and not just background music and not paying attention, falling asleep too, because the Bible is like sleeping pill for some people. If you're really paying attention, sin is a serious, serious matter that is so real to all of us. Even though the, the original sin through his redemption one time, once for all, has been redeemed perfectly. Amen? So when I receive his blood, whether you, it was uh, maybe on a Friday a prayer service, I don't know, or maybe at the retreat or Zoe the last year or two years ago, you had these moments where you cried out and that you have received his name and made his name, made him to be your Lord and your Savior. You're baptized, you receive his blood, and you have been you, redeemed and forgiven. In spite of that, unless you die right after coming out of the water, which could happen theoretically, but we have not... Let's not make history. We have not seen that happen. Uh, but if that happens, straight away, no worry about sin, go to paradise. See you later. Oh, man. But 90, I was in my, in my experience, in my line of work, 100% people live on after that. <laughs> right? Or, I mean, they do eventually die. But uh, coming out of the water, we have to face with this day where I'm still in this dirt bag. I'm going to trademark that uh, and say, Joe Kim made that dirt bag. I'm a dirt bag because I'm in a dirt body, the spirit that I am in this dirt body. So this body is tempted to sin physically, also emotionally, mentally, in the heart, in the mind, and then carry out to action. And with just at, at roll of, with the roll of my tongue, I commit sin. So I cannot even spend a day without sinning. How pathetic. 
Even though I'm going, hallelujah, Lord, Lord, child of God. But I cannot even spend the day without sinning. That's why I need to be forgiven daily. I need to be forgiven today. If you don't say amen, you don't feel like amen. It's like, what's the big deal? Why is she always talking about sin? Why is she always about sin? That's your problem. Yeah. That is your problem. You need to confess, acknowledge that you are 100% condemned as a sinner deserving the fire of hell. You can't finger point. It's all fingers must point to you and say, I'm guilty. Therefore, I need to be forgiven. So that the word, Isaiah 63, 16 saying, you, O Lord, are redeemed, our Father, our Redeemer from everlasting. That is your name. Yeshua is the name of our Redeemer, the name of our Father. Say with me, Yeshua, Yeshua. our Redeemer, our, Redeemer. Our, Father. our Father. For him to become our Father, he decided to redeem us by shedding his redeeming blood for every one of us in Adam. So when we are given the chance, we can open our ears to hear this good news of forgiveness and by simply opening our hearts and confessing that we receive his blood and we are given birth as children of God. We did not deserve this. That's why it's called amazing grace. And then we are able to receive the Holy Spirit who then makes us realize the sin that I do not want to commit, this thing I do not want to do, I keep on doing, but this thing I should be doing, I do not do because my flesh is lazy, it is worldly, it is unclean, it is filthy because it is residing in the filthy world that will become hell. So help me. Let's go to 1 John chapter 1 verses 8 to 10. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. So keep it open there, because we're going to continue reading. So what it's saying is, to the, anybody in this room going, I don't know what to pray for. So I'm just going to cry out, Yeshua, la, 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 Yeshua, la, 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 what time is it? As Hannah said, oh, it's only 10.30. I laughed at our testimony because I had the same experience. I was like, oh my God, is it like 1.30? And I looked at the watch and be like, it's only 9 o'clock. <laughs> Doing the Samaritan's first work, you know, it's like you're so tired. You're like, oh God, it must be three hours. Later. I'm like, oh no, it's just an hour later. I know that feeling, yes. And some people feel that when they're praying. They're like, oh, it must be an hour later. What? Five minutes later? This is a problem. I really want you to think this. It's for you. I don't gain anything by telling you this and, and, and trying to guide you to have a successful prayer life. I don't get no bonus. But I want you to be blessed so you don't deceive yourself. You don't deceive God. If you're sitting there and I don't know anything, I have nothing to say. I have nothing to pray for. You are deceiving God because you're saying I have nothing to confess. I'm guiltless. That's what you're saying. Is, anyone who, is there anyone who's guiltless in this room? So how can you, you actually made it to church to pray. You actually made it to that space to give time for prayer. But you still don't know what to pray for. You are deceiving yourself and the truth is not in you if that's the case. We must confess our sins for he is faithful and just when we do so he promises that he will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness hallelujah so why do you not confess why do you not repent because you don't know that you have sin you're so busy finger pointing at other people's sin you don't even know what kind of trouble you're in The fact that we have been forgiven of many, many sins, yet we're still struggling in sin, but this word gives us hope. When you read the book of Hebrews and is condemning and after being enlightened and still falling, drifting away from, from the truth, how could you be forgiven? When the, if the Bible were to end with the book of Hebrews, we're all dead. We're all in hell, guys. 
If it ends with the book of James, oh my God, but sins that you commit with your tongue, your laziness, and you don't do good works, you're going to hell. Th that's what these books are pointing at, like really prying and cutting us to the, cutting us to the heart. But it actually says in 1 John towards the end of the Bible, and then even in the book of Revelation, repent, repent, repent. Continue, chapter 2, 1 John 2, 1. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. How amazing is this? We have a defender in heaven who with his scarred body as the Lamb of God, as the Son of Man seated on the throne in the same body that he died in, the same body that he died redeeming the sins of the world that he resurrected in. With that body, he speaks on our behalf to the Father and saying, Father, these children are a bunch of fools. They're just so immature. They made a mistake. I redeem for them. I redeem. I died in their place, so please forgive them. He is our defender, Yeshua. Hallelujah. So whatever sin that we commit. So this is why before you pray, I've been giving you all these cheat sheets. Pray in the beginning of your prayer. Ask for the spirit of repentance, spirit of mourning. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be what? Comfort. Do you want to be comforted in your struggle against sin and in the struggle against grudges? You're so busy remembering other people's flaws. So, remember, so good at remembering the flaws of system and people and situations. You forget to look at yourself in the mirror. In the end, it's me. It's me. The law silences us. Shut every mouth. Why are you so busy picking and judging everybody when you should be looking at yourself? And then I'm hopeless. Am I hopeless? No, the word says we have an advocate. We have a defender. His name is Yeshua. He is our father, our redeemer. Hallelujah. That's how we are forgiven this day with caveat, with condition. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Say it with me. Forgive our, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. So what happens first? What happens first? For me to be forgiven of our debts, my sin, what happens first? I must forgive others first. No, no, this is not optional, guys. Because otherwise, you will be tortured until you pay the last penny, up to the last penny. You pay up to the last penny. Words of Yeshua, not mine. So the sin in the gospel era is not about breaking the law of Moses or the, Ten Com or the commandments, but first of all, not accepting God's forgiveness. This is unbelievers. If you don't accept God's forgiveness, when one does not, one refuses, rejects, they go to hell. So it's all, the title of the sermon is Forgiveness and Salvation, right? So the salvation of my soul. If you don't accept his, forgive, his mercy, his forgiveness, you go to hell. So I accepted it. So hallelujah, I'll be forgiven. But it's, that's not all there is to it. For the believers, there's condition. We need to be forgiven. I need to be forgiven this day that I'm living today. Daily I need to be forgiven. Condition is, I need to forgive my brothers. Their debts, their iniquities. Whatever wrong that they had done to me, I must forgive. I must forgive if not, if not, thrown into darkness where there is gnashing of teeth, weeping and gnashing of teeth. So that is not hell in heaven outside. But, but other places, as we read in Matthew 18, the servant who was forgiven of 10,000 talents, which is a lot of money, by the way. One talent is about 20 years worth of a daily wage. Wow. So he's forgiven, just frees, just um, walks off. He's been released from the debt. He sees his fellow level servant who owes him 100 denarii. 100 denarii is a daily wage. So whatever the daily wage is, times 100. Nowhere to compare with the 10,000 uh, talent. And he says, where's my money? And the guy said, I can't. And then he says, throw, I'm going to throw you into jail until you pay back. So... Hearing that, the master gets angry 
Um, and then he throws that uh, first servant into, uh, into prison and then until he should pay back all he owed. So he handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. So when you look at that there, then it doesn't actually sound like heaven, even the dark place. It's a place where you're locked up and tortured. Sounds more like hell to me. So what that means is salvation is in jeopardy, is not guaranteed for those who do not forgive. Am I making it up? First, I have to know how many of my sins have been forgiven. The more I know God, the more I know Yeshua, the more I am guilty. As Paul, I said this last night too, Paul is someone who was not hanging at the bar, guys. You think Paul was hanging out in the bar and drunk and be like, hallelujah, I've been saved? Paul was hanging out in the church, Jewish church, in the Jewish faith. Yet, when he heard the voice of the Lord, even as a perfect law-abiding Pharisee who did not think that he was guilty according to the law because he was flawless before the law. But knowing Yeshua made him feel guilty. So we read about that in the book of Romans, especially in 7. The good I want to do, this I, keep, that I do not do. But the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Therefore, his conclusion is, what a wretched man I am. Who will save me from this body of destruction? Again, he did not kill nobody. He didn't commit adultery. He didn't steal nothing. He didn't even get drunk or whatever. But deep inside, he was convicted in his heart and his thought by the word. And the more and more he knew the truth, the more and more guilty he realized he was. Therefore, he continued to write to the Christians and the churches that you read in the, in the New Testament. You must forgive. Do not slander. Speak against your brothers. And do not let the sun go down while they're still angry. While you're, where you're angry, do not let the sun go down. You need to go in, forgive your brother. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ God forgave you. Ephesians 4.32. The other one is 4.26 of Ephesians. So here's Paul who had that experience of being forgiven. So I am to, as a Christian, I must infinitely forgive those who sin against me. So this is where Peter asked Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother? My brother is someone I share blood with. Right? Yeah. So brother there is those I have, that I share the blood of Yeshua with. So here in this room, many of us are already brothers and sisters. Some of you guys are beginning in the faith or you're here for the first time. We hope that you can be brother with us. Amen. But it is forgiving the iniquities of our brothers. And how many times should we do that? He, he says seven times. I'm giving you, you know, it's like best, best deal. Seven times. Jesus said, no, not seven times. Seventy times seven today. Same guy, same thing. <laughs> what does that mean? Forgive infinitely. Stop counting. You can't. Surrender your pride, your judgment. Lay it down. Your memory, crush it. Throw it out the window. That's what it means. You need to forgive, and that is to crush yourself, crush your pride, crush your judgment, and lay down having the power as a true Christian, a child of God. I must live the Christian life, which is forgiving in order for me to be forgiven this day. Amen? Do you need to be forgiven this day? So what do we need to do? Forgive. This is where we need to struggle and cry out and pray. If you still have some arrogance in you and going, uh-uh, I can't, I can't. Do you, God ha you, have to, you have to work that out with God because with that in place, you don't go where the Father is. So I need to, first of all, know what kind of sinner I am and how I'm still struggling in sin. Whatever it's coming up to your mind and your heart, your mood, all of that, you need to say it in your prayer. Confess, repent, so that you can be forgiven. But the first thing you need to do, just as Yeshua said in Matthew 5, about if you have a gift to God, you need to first leave, it, leave the gift at the altar and be reconciled to your brother because no matter how much is in that bag, God is going to say, I never received it. You gave it to church, and the church is going to put it in, the Chase Bank. But God says, I never received it. 
So in that state of not reconciled and holding back and, and, and gr holding grudges, God says, I don't know any about that. I don't know you. In the end, what, what if he said, I don't know you? And, the, and Pastor King said it so nicely. It's not just saying in your heart, you know what, this part, I repented as well. Many, many years ago when I was actually young and early 20s in college and was doing the praise team, and I think I talked about it some time ago too, and like the church was small, and I got so angry at somebody in the band because, you know, band people get angry. And so, you know, it's all, we're musicals, so we're all moody people. So I was angry, and I just had this like, oh, like, ooh, and then it had the conflict, and the person... I, I, I struggled and I felt like I was right and they didn't prepare and they, they, they messed up and all that. So then I struggled and I repented um, and we, we made, um, we were okay, but then um, they're no longer. So they left. This was again, long, long time ago, but I don't think I said it clear because I was young and that person was much older and they were actually deacon. I was not. So I don't think I actually spelled it out and say, I'm sorry. So preparing the sermon Remind, reminded me of that, that I did forgive in my heart and I talked to them afterwards and everything was like, okay, you know. But I don't think I actually said, I forgive you or forgive me. I forgive you, I want you to forgive me. I don't think I ever said that. So I repented that today, you know, because what if it doesn't count? I don't just... Think it. I don't just feel it, but I have to take it into action to release, be, to, for me to be released from my burden, I need to also release them. So just as I have forgiven them, I need to be forgiven. So I said, Father, I forgave these brothers and sisters of mine, so forgive me. That is a true Christian, true child of God who knows the power of forgiveness. And if I had been forgiven, what do I do? Inevitably, as I'm sent back out into the world by the fellowship, the power of the Holy Spirit, I must preach the gospel of forgiveness to whosoever. There are unbelievers out there who do not know about the mercy of God. I need to bring this good news to them. So forgiveness and salvation is this interconnected. So, so important. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they are not forgiven, Jesus said. If I keep my mouth shut, they remain dead in sin and go to hell. But if I might open my mouth, they have a chance to hear the mercy of God so that they can be released of their debt and be moved from hell to heaven. Hallelujah! That's what Peter also said, repent and be baptized every one of you the name, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, Acts 38, Acts 10, 43. Everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So the forgiven is saved and the saved is he who saves, who forgives. Let me say it again. The forgiven, someone who is forgiven is someone who is saved. Amen? Have you been forgiven? Have you been saved from your past sins? You have been redeemed, that is. Amen? If you are saved, then you forgive. So that's the phrase. The forgiven is the saved, and the saved forgives. Let's say that three times. The forgiven is the saved, and the saved forgives. Once again. One more time. The forgiven is a saved, and the saved forgives. Amen? As you read through the epistles, Paul keeps on writing the churches because he is interested and so cautious about the church staying true, the gospel staying true, and the responsibility is with the members of the church, the body of Christ. And if we are disputing and arguing and unforgiving and grudgingly judging one another and holding and thinking about keeping track, you know, it's just like all, my, all the records, like stats. Watching a sports game, all the stats coming up. That's some people's memories, like all the stats coming up. Last year, the year before, three years ago, four. Some people are like, wow, how do you remember that? 15 years ago, they did this and that. Wow, how do you sleep at night? All of that. I, my, all my sins, my countless sins have been forgiven. And if I'm forgiven, I'm safe. And I know the grace of God. How can I still be judging and holding grudges and going, mm, 
Martin and my brothers and sisters and expect the Lord to say, come my child, come and take your seat on the table, at the table, eat and drink with me. Don't we want to be at the Lord's table as we heard on Friday? Like Mephibosheth. The king saying, you will eat with me at my table all the days of your life. I want to sit at the table of my king, my father, our father, Yeshua in heaven. And I want all of us to take all of your seats around the table and be there. But in order for us to be there, we have to do this work of preaching the gospel forgiveness to unbelievers. So they too experience the mercy of God and be forgiven. And that I infinitely, even if it's hard, that I don't keep record anymore. But I forgive, forgive, forgive. And that's why I'm praying, I'm praying, and praying for the power to forgive. Hallelujah. Let's pray.